Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 247, recorded on June 29th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start this week with the leading edge of the Linux desktop and some new details about what's coming in Fedora 37. Yeah, there's a lot here. In fact, we're going to have to link to most of it, but there's just so many things landing right now because the Fedora Engineering and Steering Committee has approved a fresh batch of features for the next version of Fedora. And there's a lot in here, but what does jump out at me is just some serious movements around the servers, I guess, additions of Fedora, including both the cloud workloads and the CoreOS workloads. Uh, For example, CoreOS may actually get promoted to an official edition this release cycle, but something that I'm surprised we haven't seen before, but is definitely much needed for Fedora in the cloud. We're now going to have a Fedora KVM disk image, which will be shipped as part of Fedora 37, server edition. Well, sticking with that server focus for just a moment, a change proposal has now been filed for getting Stratus 3.1 into Fedora 37. The proposal notes, quote, Stratus 3.1.0 includes significant improvements to the management of the thin provisioning layers, as well as a number of other user-visible enhancements and bug fixes. So if you are a Stratus user out there, sounds like a release you don't want to miss. I have a feeling this is one of those land episodes that you and I are going to have like a big to-do list afterwards, because this is one of those things, and we're going to get to another one in a minute, that we're going to have to try. Uh, On the desktop side of things, especially for us x86-64 users, Fedora is now going to use GPT partitioning on new installs rather than MBR or MS-DOS for biosystems. Currently, Fedora only uses GPT disk labels on an EFI system. And perhaps the biggest news buried in all of this is this new long-term effort by Red Hat that's recently just begun to address general accessibility issues in Fedora. Yeah, on June 27th, Christian Schaller announced that Red Hat has hired a blind software engineer to lead their efforts in, quote, making sure Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Fedora Workstation has excellent accessibility support. And it looks like some of Lucas's first work will be going through applications which were ported to GTK4 as part of the recent GNOME development cycle. Then it sounds like they plan to expand out from there and get broader and broader. In the announcement, they also write, quote, What we hope to get from this is not only a better experience for our users, but also to allow even more talented engineers like Lucas to work on Linux and open source software at Red Hat. We'll have a link to the announcement in the show notes. And, you know, it's really just kind of a great read to get a high-level understanding of the state of accessibility on Linux as it stands right now. And, of course, where we might see improvements in the not-too-distant future. Two listener favorites got big updates this week. Starting quickly with Firefox 102, I mean, there's really nothing too exciting in this release. There's a few things. I mean, I guess maybe you're a big fan of reading PDFs in high contrast mode, or you've been looking forward to improved geolocation support under Linux, but in general, it's nothing that's going to knock your socks off. Well, if that doesn't excite you, maybe Thunderbird 102 should, because this one seems like a big upgrade. For one, it introduces a new address book implementation, which surely took some work and maybe the biggest change in this entire release. But there's also a new import-export wizard, a redesigned message header, and a few UI refinements like new icons and color folders that really pop. And of course, there's also that matrix chat support, which is probably something we should be trying. I was telling you, Wes, this is one of those episodes where we're going to have a to-do list. I mean, I've never thought about Matrix in my email client, but I have to admit, I recently have been thinking about giving Thunderbird a go again, and I would probably try out the Matrix stuff. There's some notable UI changes since I last looked at Thunderbird that have landed in this release specifically. There's this new Spaces toolbar. They say it gives you fast and easy access to the most important activities. So in a single click, you can navigate between mail your address book, your calendar, your tasks, and your chats, or any of the other add-ons that you've installed. And the UI looks really slick. They've done a good job of making it easy to jump through there without taking up a huge portion of your UI sidebar to actually make it possible. And we have it on good authority that Thunderbird 102 is just the start of many good things to come. We did have a chat with Ryan Sipes recently. That was in episode 245 of Linux Action News. Don't miss that. Speaking of Matrix, 
Synapse admins had to jump to action this week when it was discovered that in some cases, a URL preview could trigger a denial-of-service attack on a home server. Just a good old URL preview. Yeah, it seems like it was possible for this to be used maliciously, either by a user on the home server or if a remote user sent a URL, which then a local user of that server tried to preview automatically with their client, it could then trigger the exploit. That's kind of the funny thing about it. Remote users were not actually able to directly trigger the exploit, but if a local user is in that room and their client set to preview the URL, <laughs> guess what? It's going to trigger it. Thankfully, though, the mitigation's pretty easy. URL previews aren't enabled by default, so if you do have them on, you need to flip that off ASAP or update to release 1.61.1 or greater. Not really a huge issue, since it's just a dial service and thankfully not something worse, but we wanted to make sure the word gets out. So are you still waiting on your Steam Deck? Well, we have some good news and some bad news. Valve tweeted this week saying it has more than doubled the number of Steam Decks being produced every week. The company also says it just sent out the last batch of Q2 reservation emails and is prepared to start kicking off Q3 reservations on the 30th of June. That said, the expected availability date hasn't changed. It still says October 2022 or later. But, you know, there is a chance that this date will change with production ramping up, since, you know, so far it's basically remained the same for months. All this makes me curious, Chris. Have you been checking on your order status? Of course I did. Of course. Nothing's changed. Uh, you can Anyone can check. You can go to store.steampower.com slash Steam Deck, and then you have to log in with your Steam ID. I ordered the 512 gig version, and uh, Steam tells me that my expected order availability is Q3, July through September of 2022, which could be any day um, as we record, or could be... A, way, a ways away. Um, but the funny thing is, Wes, as time goes on, honestly, the less I'm excited about it. I don't know. We'll see what happens first. I get my Steam Deck or I lose interest and cancel my pre-order. Stay tuned and find out. Nano fans need not apply because the world's truly best text editor has taken a big step with a major new release. Vim 9.0 has been announced. And besides many small additions, the spotlight this time around is on a new incarnation of the Vim script language, Vim 9 script. A new incarnation of the Vim script language? What is this, Emacs? What does Vim need this for? Okay, okay, let's set a little context here. Vim's been around for a long time, as has its scripting language. And it's basically preserved backwards compatibility most of that time. And that means whatever perhaps bad choices from the past that were made, those are still haunting us today. Keep in mind, there's also some compatibility with things like legacy VI that are a factor here. All of that adds up, and it means that execution is slow. It doesn't help that each line is parsed and interpreted every time it's executed. So one of the main goals of this new script is to dramatically improve performance. One way that's accomplished is by compiling commands into bytecode that can be more efficiently executed so it doesn't have to be parsed every time. And that, that leads to an expected increase in execution speed of something like 10 to 100 times. Now, besides that great performance improvement, a secondary goal of this whole new script version is to avoid some Vim-specific oddities, which are definitely there, and get a lot closer to something more like a programming language developers are already using. You know, something like JavaScript, Python, or Java. Lino.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support the show. Linode is really the Linux geeks cloud. With 11 data centers worldwide, they've been working at this for nearly 19 years, and they have built the best experience for running applications on Linux. I hear it from listeners all the time. They're blown away by the performance, the support, and the pricing. All the things that drew me in. And if you like to build things yourself or you like to do things with simple one-click deployments, Linode has infrastructure that's going to work for you. Pricing, skill level, they got something to match all of it. 
I think once you get in there, you'll be damn impressed by the performance. It's freaking incredible. They got their own ISP connections, right? Like they don't like deal with somebody else. They are their own ISP. And with 11 data centers around the world, there's something that's going to work for you. Something that's close to you. And one of the things I really appreciate is I've been a customer now for over two and a half years is Linode is always rolling out better and faster stuff. AMD Epic processors, MVME based block storage, physical servers, database as a service, object storage expansion. It has just been something like every month. Linode's always working on stuff. And their team is always analyzing what's going on in the world. In fact, they publish a security digest report that's super useful for anyone in the industry, even if you're not a Linode customer. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. It's a good read if you're looking for a snapshot of what you need to know about in the Linux security world right now. After you've been using Linode for a minute, if you're like me, I think you'll learn to appreciate some of the tooling built around it. They have a really straightforward API, super easy to understand. There's libraries for like Python and just about everything else out there that you could plug in with an existing application, or you could use their pre-built CLI application. I do that. It's a great way to interface with their S3 object storage, which is freaking great. And what really puts things over the top is you can get $100 and support the show. And then you can go build something. You can learn something. You can try something. See what professional-grade services are like from people that have been doing this for nearly 19 years that really know their stuff. Go try it. Go support the show and get 100 bucks in credit. Linode.com slash LAN. You might have heard Apple has some shiny new M chips. And maybe you were wondering just how long it's going to take to get Linux working on them. Well, Hector Martin, who's been leading the effort to get Linux working on Apple's new SoCs, held a marathon live development stream this week to kick that bring up process off. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, today, I'm going to be bringing up uh, Asahi Linux on the new Apple M2 chip. And this was quite the stream. I think it was over 11 hours long. So, yeah, you're going to get to see the whole process. And kind of ironically, even though the stream was over 11 hours long, it only took Hector about 20 minutes to get Linux booting on the M2. Yay, it's alive. Cool. All right. So we're good. It runs. That was easy. First try. And there we go. It's, it's alive. You could really tell he was excited. <laughs> he was happy to get that going. But then he spent the rest of the stream just tweaking things. And then his chat room joked that they'd gone to bed and woke up to find Hector still hacking away on the stream. But of course, there's still more work to be done. Unfortunately, the keyboard and the trackpad with the new Apple M2 devices will require a new driver to work properly. Additionally, SPMI will need a new driver. And the PCIe support needs a fuse map in the mini code to initialize properly. There's also PMU, Thunderbolt, and a bunch of other functionality that's still on the growing to-do list. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff. And of course, there's also that Apple graphics stack. That's really the elephant in the desktop room right now. Uh, progress has been made there, though, including we got a triangle drawn on the screen. But let's be real. There's still just a long ways to go just on the graphics stack. Yeah, I require at least two triangles for my desktop minimum, please. I'd say it's safe to say set your expectations to months at best before we have something like a full-featured OpenGL driver or a DRM kernel driver that was suitable for upstreaming or anything close to those. Yeah, I'd say that's probably fair. Maybe we'll be pleasantly surprised, but I'd say months too. But we'll keep an eye on this and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source news. So be sure you go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes and linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. Hey, you want to get this show ad-free? Maybe you want to support all the shows on the network and get all the shows ad-free? Become a member at jupiter.party. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs> <laughs>